Somebody told okay. a joke. Okay, uh, <laughs> welcome back, everyone. Um, I think it was really good lunch. I hope everybody enjoyed the uh, the taste in New Brunswick. I thought it was a, a really nice variance and a lot of different things in, especially the Coburn cider. Yeah. Very good. So welcome to our afternoon presentation. We, we thought we'd try something different this year, and we're going to do a fireside chat uh, format with the Smart en Smart Energy Company, along with Rothamay Farms, New Meadow Farms, and Dunfries Poultry <coughs> Farm Limited. Uh, to look at solar power and solar panels installed on farms. So all three of the farms represented here have installed solar panels recently, and, and they're all very similar, but also a little bit different in different ways of doing things. And today we're just going to have a general talk about that, and, and, uh, and Smart Energy is here. Uh, Jeff McLoon from the Smart Energy Company is here with us today, and, and he's going to do a little presentation and cover a lot of topics. And, uh, you know, he asked me before we started, like, you know, sort of the highlights and, you know, what, what things he should mention. And I said, well, you're talking to a group of farmers. All we want to know is how much does it cost, how do I pay for it, and will the government give me some of it? So, <laughs> and then when that's all done, how much work is it to maintain the thing? So, like, you know, I don't know what else he's going to cover, but I said, if you're, it doesn't matter if you're talking about manure spreaders or solar panels. Those are the four things that, uh, that producers want to know. And representing the farms, uh, representing the farms with us today uh, from Rothamay Farms Limited, we have Jesse Mitham. Thank you for joining us today. We have Justin Dumphy from Dumphy's Poultry Farm and Paul McConkey from New Meadow Farm. And I and I really like the fact that we have three young producers up here uh, representing the province of New Brunswick, representing their farms, and taking us into you know the next generation. So welcome everybody to our chat. And I will um, I will ask Jeff to come up, and you can start your presentation. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, so my name is Jeff McAloon. I'm here with my brother Mark McAloon and my colleague Robin Turner. Uh, we're really, really grateful to have this opportunity to be with you today. Um, je suis pas francophone, mais je me débrouille. Alors, à la fin, s'il y a des questions, vous, vous voulez poser en français, I'll, I'll do my best to translate. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to speak for about you know, 15 or maybe 20 minutes. I'll try to keep it as short as I can. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, who we are as a company, how we help farmers, how we've been working with farmers. Um, I'll talk a little bit about solar and battery in Atlantic Canada and how it works and what's a typical project look like. We're going to talk about the costs and the grants and the incentives. Uh, and then I'm really looking forward to getting into some questions from the audience. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with, uh, so at the Smart Engine Company, we generate independence. Um, we're, uh, we're a family business. My brother Mark and I own the business. Our 71-year-old dad won't retire and just wants to keep helping us out too. So um, the reason I mention that is this cover photo is one of our installations at McCain's Farms of the Future in Florenceville. We're really proud to partner with McCain's, but I think what makes this picture even more special for us and this idea of we generate independence is that our family is not far from here. Um, so we learned this, this idea of generating independence, doing things for yourself and for your family and your business was bred into us by our Grampy John, who is from Perth Andover. Um, we have a family camp behind Bath in a little, little village, out behind Johnville, if anyone knows Johnville, New Brunswick, we're behind Johnville. Um, and as we were growing up as little boys, our Grampy John taught us, if you need to eat something, you can grow it. If you need to fix something, you can fix it. Um, uh, so just our whole lives, we've been taught that if there's something that needs doing, don't rely or wait on others to do it, you can do it yourself. And I think that's, that's in the DNA of who Mark and I are and in the DNA of our company as well. So uh, we are a renewable energy developer. We work primarily with farmers. Uh, we really see a future where farmers all over the world are going to generate their own electricity on their farm. And that's why we're here. We hope to help save farmers billions of dollars in electricity costs. When Mark and I were <clears throat> brainstorming that idea of helping farmers save money, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could help farmers save a billion dollars in electricity costs, keep it from the utilities and keep it in their pockets? And as we did the math and the projects we had already done, we were over sort of $400 million. So we said, OK, a billion's not enough. It's billions, I guess. So um, we, uh, as I said earlier, we've, well, we've been in business since 2016. Uh, we've worked with a number of different industries, most of which have been farmers. And we're really proud to have uh, worked on farms. We learn a lot from our farm customers. We've done over half of all of the solar in New Brunswick. So any solar panel that you go past in New Brunswick, there's a one out of two chance that it's been installed by our company. We manufacture the Nor'easter solar farm. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a slide or two here. Um, that's, that solar farm actually uh, comes in a do-it-yourself kit that we'll talk about as well. That do-it-yourself kit idea was inspired by a farmer. It was the Colpitts family. Um, anyone know the, the McRae Farms in Shannon, New Brunswick? 
So when we were talking to them about solar, they said, well, look, there must be some part of this project we can do. Can we dig the holes? Can we run the trenches for the wiring? And they pointed across the street to another field where they had a big dairy barn that they bought from a kit, from a German company in a kit. And we thought, that's a heck of a great idea. So we rented some warehouse space in St. John. <clears throat> we built the nor'easter, took it down, did that three times. We filmed it and we wrote some instructions and we gave it to the family and said, okay, give us a try and give us your feedback. And they, they built, well, they're the first people, frankly, anywhere to have built a commercial grade solar farm by themselves. And they gave us great feedback on those instructions and the kit that we put together. And now over half of our farmers actually choose to build it themselves. That project itself won a national clean energy award this year in Canada. So we're, we're really proud to have, to have had that learning for our business from, from farmers. Um, I was so glad, Hans, that you said what you said at the beginning of the day today, because I was absolutely going to talk about all those points because we hear it from every farmer. This is what we've learned in eight years of working with farmers. <clears throat> farmers want solutions that are simple to integrate. You kind of have a long list of chores already. You don't want anything else to add to that list of chores. So we keep that in mind as we develop our solutions. Farmers are interested in solutions that will reduce costs. There's no, uh, it's not a big secret that costs are rising in your industry and it's really challenging to run a profitable farm business. So if we can provide solutions that will help you with that, we think we're going in the right direction. Uh, there's a growing pressure on farmers to reduce emissions. I mean, farmers are the original stewards of the land, but there's growing conversations in government, municipality, commodity groups, buying groups, to ask farmers, what else are you doing to help reduce your emissions? And so we're, we're, we provide solutions to help do that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. And then finally, farmers want solutions that are durable. You don't live in the easiest, sunshiny, calmest part of the world. You get a lot of snow, you get a lot of wind, you get a lot of harsh conditions, and it's frankly a waste of your time if any solution you put on your farm is not going to last for a long time. So we, we obviously keep that durability in mind as we develop our solutions. So there's, there's a number of <clears throat> challenges that farm businesses have that we try to help them solve. Um, here are three of them. Uh, first and foremost, the top of every single farmer that we have ever met, their first and foremost challenge is the rapid and unpredictable increase in electricity rates. Um, it's challenging, especially if you're in a, a quota-based uh, business where you have limited opportunity to increase your revenue. Um, when one of your cost lines is increasing by double digits, that's challenging for any business. We've seen, well, the folks in New Brunswick have seen uh, a talk of a 14% increase in electricity here in New Brunswick in the spring. Um, in Berwick, Nova Scotia, where some of our friends who had to leave uh, are based, 24% uh, increase. And that utility said, by the way, expect that for two or three years. We work in Southwest Ontario. Hydro One just increased everybody's rates by 20%. These are, these are not minimal increases to an important input cost line in your business. So that is probably the number one challenge that we, we like to help farmers solve. Finally, I talked about this earlier, but there is a growing pressure on uh, reducing emissions. There will come a day, unfortunately, probably not in the far too distant future, when we as all businesses and consumers will start being directly charged the carbon tax. We're, we're paying for it in indirect ways now, but that's, that's an area that we can help farmers. Um, and then finally, and we'll talk a bit more about this later, um, most farms in Canada are in rural parts of Canada where the electricity grid is the most unstable. And so grid outages clearly impact your business. And so we try to find solutions that can help farmers from a business continuity standpoint from a power. There's a, there's a fair amount of urgency to the work that we're doing. Um, I spoke about the double digit rate increases, the, the climate change uh, urgency already. Um, uh, there are some substantial tax incentives that have been implemented that I'll get into a little bit more detail that, that really improve the affordability of renewable energy solutions. And then finally, and I'm, I'm sure you're all very well aware, but there are some significant utility rate changes that are being contemplated in New Brunswick. Farmers in New Brunswick, for the most part, are on residential meters, and MB Power is considering switching you to commercial meters. Um, and that's gonna, if that goes through, that's gonna have a significant impact on your bottom line. We estimate, uh, you'll, you'll start on a commercial meter, you'll pay what's called a demand charge. So they'll look at all of the energy you've used over the course of a month, and they'll look for the peak, the highest amount that you've drawn from the grid, and you'll get a surcharge for that peak of power. 
We estimate uh, like a 200 amp electrical entrance. I know all of you probably have much larger energy consumption needs than that, but a 200 amp entrance is probably going to see about a $500 to $800 demand charge on their monthly power bill. So these are substantial changes. Uh, we've been working really closely with the New Brunswick Agriculture Alliance. They've formed a subcommittee that has intervener status on the Electricity Utilities Board. Um, and so we've been supporting them with, with guidance and advice from our perspective mm -hmm. so that whatever changes MB Power contemplates, that they make sure that they're doing it to help advance your businesses and not to put you further behind. Really, really important to us. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the solar technology, um, and, and I'll also let you know that probably, does anyone in the room, by the way, other than the guys up here, anyone else have solar on their farm or any experience with solar energy? No one here? Okay. I'm not going to get too much in the weeds. Mark is our technical expert. I'm really not, so I may rely on him for some help for some questions later. Um, but I would say probably nine out of ten inquiries we get, people call and say, can you put solar on my barn? And we say, well, we can, but we won't. <laughs> and we'll tell you why. Um, and there's a couple of reasons. Um, first and foremost, we don't like poking holes in roofs. It can void warranties. It can cause leaks and challenges. And then when the roof needs to be replaced, you've got an even more expensive replacement because you've got to take all your solar off and put it back on. Um, secondly, every roof is pitched differently. It's pointed to the sun in a different degree. And it's not optimal for producing electricity. Um, but more importantly, it's about snow. And so when we put solar panels on the ground, we can use what are called bifacial solar panels. So they're, they're double-sided solar panels. And they do exactly the same on the back as they do in the front. But what's special about these is that overnight, if there's any, especially if we get a wet, sticky snow overnight, it, it will accumulate on the front of the solar panels. But as soon as the sun comes up, it reflects on the ground, like you see in there in the animation. And it hits the back of the solar panel, and it creates more electricity, which is great, about 8 to 10% more. But most importantly, it warms the front. It's almost like the front of the panels are like in a defrost mode. And the, by 9.30, quarter to 10, the snow sloughs off. Have you guys noticed? Is that sort of fair in your estimation? Yeah. 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 Sure. So, so that is the most important reason that we put solar panels on the ground. There are some other reasons as well, but it's really about having a system that we can confidently predict how much electricity it's going to generate. You're not actually buying a solar farm, you're buying electricity. And, and the better that we can predict how much energy is going to be produced, the better your return on investment. So I, I've covered some of this. So, so we, um, <clears throat> when Mark, can I tell the story about your first year and your call from Frank Jopp? Yeah, I'm going to tell the story. <laughs> so when, when Mark started the company, we were buying racking systems that were made in other parts of the world from other manufacturers. We were a small startup company. Um, and our very first customer, Dairy Farmer, called a couple months after installation and he said, boys, my solar panels are flying through the field. Is that supposed to happen? <laughs> Clearly no. Pretty embarrassing for us. We spent a year going back and re-welding and fixing and modifying all these structures that we bought from other manufacturers. At the end of the day, they didn't even look like we originally bought. So Mark wisely said, well, I'm not going to use what word he said, but we, we're, we can't build a business like that. So he decided that we're going to design and manufacture our own made in New Brunswick solution. And that's when the Nor'easter was born. So we have made this thing robust to withstand hurricane force winds. We did a large installation for MB Power and Shediac, and it took a direct hit from Hurricane Fiona. Was, we measured 100 and, 180, 184 kilometer an hour winds. Um, and there were, it, zero damage. And so we have, we have built this thing to last for the long term. In fact, it's the only racking system anywhere that we can confidently offer a 50-year warranty. Um, it's not made of galvanized steel. We've made it out of structural aluminum. And I said earlier that it's the only kit that comes in a, in a do-it-yourself kit, if you so choose. <clears throat> I did hear one other farmer, though, today, so I don't have enough time to do that. I don't get enough on my list. So our team is happy to build it as well. Um, Sarah asked me to talk a little bit about what's involved in the solar project. And so I've kind of put the, the five or six key points here. Um, most uh, solar projects, or at least we would recommend most solar projects, start with gathering some data so that you can, because these, these can be capital intensive projects, and so it's important that you have information to support your capital decision. And so often we'll do a solar feasibility study for our customers where we'll do a detailed design, we'll look at the energy created, how much cost you'll reduce from your electricity, what's the capital cost, what are the, uh, the, the incentives and the grants that you're eligible for. 
Um, the great news for New Brunswickers is that NB Power has a program that will essentially pay for the cost of your study. They're not very high cost to begin with, but when you deploy solar from the recommended study, um, NB Power will cover the whole cost of the study. But the main message here is that it gives you information, gives you data so that you can make informed decisions for your business. Once uh, a customer decides to go ahead with a solar project, there's a bunch of metering, that, a bunch of permitting that has to happen. So we apply for net metering permits, we apply for electrical permits. There is a really special condition in New Brunswick called the farm condition, and this doesn't exist, as far as we can tell, doesn't exist anywhere else, and it doesn't exist for any other customer types in New Brunswick except for farmers. Um, and that is many farms, possibly all farms, have many electrical meters. And so a farmer has the choice to connect solar to the meter that's most convenient for them. We don't want you to put solar in the middle of a field where you're cropping or you know, in, in, a, in a part of the field where you're going to build your new lay barn. But you can connect it in the part of your property that's most convenient to you. But you can offset the electricity from all of the electrical meters in your property. We're paying <clears throat> excuse me, very close attention to the changes with the Energy Utility Board to make sure that they never change that because that is a real important benefit for farmers in New Brunswick. Um, then after those permits are acquired, there's the installation or the assembly of the system. Um, once that's complete and the inspection has been completed by the Department of Public Safety, um, NB Power will install a bi-directional meter. And so that's just a way for them to tell how much power you're pulling from the grid and how much power you're pushing back to the grid. Uh, and then finally, the project is commissioned and turned over to the customer. Um, we've had some people say, well, we're in the Maritimes, we're not in Arizona, does solar even work for my business? So I took a screenshot of one of our customers to just give you an example of a typical business. Um, their electrical needs versus what the sun is capable of producing. And so the blue line here it, for this customer is the energy that they're consuming. The, the trough here is at night, so that's 12 a.m. And the peak here is in the middle of the day, 12 p.m. And then the yellow line represents the solar that's being produced. So for this particular customer, they're producing far more energy than they need. They're putting it back to the grid. But the main message with this graph is that the sun actually, for most businesses that are running during the day, the sun will produce pretty much all of your energy needs when it's designed effectively. There will be some energy in the evenings that you're obviously not producing from the sun, but anything in here that's, cr that's generated and not used goes as a credit on your bill, and so you'll use those credits in the evening time. So just an example, sort of a visual of a, a live customer. There's so much happening in the world of battery. We kind of call this the age of battery. Um, there are great battery solutions. Battery solutions are no longer the more expensive solution. They are more cost effective, believe it or not, than many other traditional sources of backup power like diesel and natural gas. Um, batteries are great for backup power, clearly. Um, but in other jurisdictions, and possibly coming to New Brunswick, we will start paying, like I explained earlier, those demand charges. And we'll also start paying different rates of electricity for different times of day. So today in New Brunswick, battery can help you with backup power. In the future, battery will help you save more costs because you can bring your peak demand down with battery and have less of a surcharge. And you can also program your battery to discharge during the day when MB Power is going to charge you higher rates of electricity. We see that now in Nova Scotia. We see it in Ontario. Mark, I don't think we see time of use in PEI yet, do we? Don't think so. But that, again, that will come to New Brunswick at one point, and so there, there's a lot more economic value in addition to backup power that battery can provide. Uh, the incentives, Hans, the incentives and the rebates and the ROI, and there are many, many, many. Um, I'm going to go through a live example, so I'll just kind of flip through this really quickly. But in New Brunswick, there are provincial incentives that are tied to the size of your solar farm, essentially. So we measure how much energy it will create in its first year, and then MB Power will give you a cash incentive equivalent to, a, there's a certain formula to use. So that's a cash incentive right off the top. Um, many of you already take advantage of the Atlantic Investment Tax Credit, so a 10% refundable tax credit for many innovations that you put on your farm. Batteries and solar are eligible for this program as well. Um, last spring, the federal government implemented a clean technology and a clean electricity investment tax credit. This is absolutely magic. It's a 30% refundable tax credit. 
So um, I'm going to skip ahead and come back to this one. I'm going to skip ahead to that next one, the accelerated capital cost allowance. I'm going to try not to get too much into accountant speak, but this accelerated capital cost allowance has been around for quite a while. And what it allows you to do is take 100% of the capital cost of a project that's renewable in nature, battery or solar, and you can depreciate that 100% of that in one year, which is really great. It reduces your taxable income, but feedback we get from many farmers is we, we, we work hard to not have a huge taxable income at the end of the year, uh, and so that, you know, we have to spread that out over many years. So it's helpful, but it's not maybe immediately helpful. So I'm going to go back to number three, the Clean Technology Investment Tax Credit. And why that's so magical, it's a refundable tax credit. So even if you have zero taxes owing at the end of the year, that is now a cash refund on your annual tax return. It's not a grant program. It doesn't require an application. It's a conversation with your accountant to say we want to make sure we incorporate this into our year-end tax return. It's a really, really fantastic program. Uh, and so the typical payback that we see on commercial solar farms is around six to eight, maybe nine years, depending on the scale of the project. So it's a, it's a very substantial payback. I always, I, I like when folks ask me what's the ROI on solar, and a bit of a smart ass response is, well, what's your ROI with MB Power right now? <laughs> Calculate that and let me know. <laughs> um, so here's just kind of a live example of all of those rebates in action. So if um, you know, someone was to spend $45,000 capital cost on battery or solar. This is what all of those incentives I just spoke about look like. So the net cost of the business is just over $21,000. So it can be pretty substantial. Sorry, I said the wrong number. $23,000. It's $21,000, almost $22,000 in incentives. Um, again, Sarah also asked me to give a little bit of a summary of some of the similarities and differences between the three maritime provinces. So in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and PEI, we all allow uh, net metering, which is where energy that you produce and don't use goes back to the grid and comes back to you in the form of a credit. There are some rules around that. We have uh, in PEI, New Brunswick, a 100 kilowatt cap. That's the size of the solar farm. Um, uh, in Nova Scotia, they've increased that to 1,000 kilowatt a one megawatt cap, so we are lobbying government as effectively as we can to consider matching our friends in Nova Scotia. That's a substantial uh, benefit to farmers there. Um, farmers in New Brunswick, though, as I said, have advantage to that virtual net metering where you can connect to any meter on your farm. Uh, the, the provincial incentives, again, I won't read through them all, but they're, they're, they're slightly different in different areas. Um, we've, we've just started doing business in PEI and we've learned that there's a, a really exceptional um, provincial incentive in Prince Edward Island uh, and it's, you know, it's uh, sort of outlined here on the slide. So I'm going to get into our farm projects that we partnered with the guys up here. So this is Rothamay Farm. Uh, this is a recent ribbon cutting we did with our local member of parliament and Jesse and Bruce and Mark and I, and that was a really great day. It was cold, but the sun was out and we were producing a lot of electricity and it was a, it was a really special day. Um, so this is what we call a nor'easter 10. So each nor'easter is just 10 kilowatts. So 10 of them is 100 kilowatts, and that's the size of the farm that we, the solar farm that our team built at Rothmay Farms. Their minimum lifetime energy savings, almost $900,000. When we model energy savings, NB Power tells us to use an inflationary rate of 5.7% increase. Well, we, can, we know that the next two years are going to be 14%, so that's why I've said this is a minimum lifetime energy savings. And over 1.2 million, million kilograms of CO2 will no longer be emitted in the atmosphere because of their leadership, which is the same as 11, over 11 million kilometers of passenger vehicles being driven. So, Obviously, on one hand, a great reduction in expense for the business, but also a phenomenal contribution to our planet. Next project. Here's Paul and his daughter. I got to take those eggs home. Robin and I took those eggs home. There, that was, actually, was the first day that I learned that eggs do not need to be refrigerated. Yeah. And I wore these egg socks, I think, that day, too. Yeah, so, I think uh, you did. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> so Paul's uh, farm uh, is, uh, this is the at least at the time, sort of the first phase of a, of a solar installation that Paul was looking at. So it's a Nor'easter 2, that's 20 kilowatts. Paul chose to do our in-a-box kit. It was his uncle Robert that built it. He did such an amazing job installing this. I tried to hire him, but he told me he was in retirement. Uh, so this system has a minimum lifetime energy savings of 175, a little over $175,000. 
230,000 kilograms of CO2 no longer emitted, and over 2.1 million kilometers of uh, passenger vehicles. And this is Dunphy Farms. And so here we built a Nor'easter 12, which is just 12 of those kits, 120 kilowatts. We've also installed a, a Generac battery system, a 72 kilowatt hour back battery system. We believe, we haven't really done super extensive research, but we're pretty sure this is the first barn in Canada that's now fully backed up by power. And we're really proud to have supported Justin and his family with that. Minimum lifetime energy savings of close to a million dollars. Uh, over 1.3 kilograms, 1.3 million kilograms of CO2, and over 12 million equivalent kilometers driven by passenger vehicles. The, uh, so again, our team installed this, but the difference in this project from the other two is the battery that we installed. And so this is not perhaps easy for folks in the very back to see, but I wanted to show you the app that Justin would have on his farm. And so he has a live app that shows how, this up here represents his battery, and at this time his battery wasn't discharging. It was just 100% charged and ready for backup power. So it says zero because it's not putting out any energy. This is what he's producing. If you can see it, there's a little line going here. That's what the sun is producing and putting into his building. That's how much his building is consuming. And the sun was producing more than he needed, so the line is going back to the grid. He's actually feeding energy back into the grid for net metering. And this is a live app that changes based on the conditions of the sun and based on his energy consumption on the barn. Cool. And then I also wanted to show you, um, we went up to the farm and simulated a power outage. Actually, the week after we commissioned the, the installation, um, MB Power lost power and there wasn't power in the area for four days. I would never ever wish a power outage on my customer, but my gosh, it was pretty cool to see it actually work <laughs> in real life the week after we installed it. So we went up much later, I think this was just a couple weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, Mark and Justin, and we turned off the power to simulate a power outage, and I just wanted to show you the immediacy with which the batteries take over. So, you know, in this case, Justin's turning off the power, but if the grid went out, the battery system would automatically come on, and I'll just sort of show you the delay here. So the power is going out, and the batteries took over. So it's really instantaneous. And I believe that the, all of the other devices that were connected didn't phase them. None of them were tripped or reset. And all the devices are able to be powered in, a, in an outage scenario. I'm sure Justin will have lots more to talk about that after. Uh, OK, I'm just going to flip screens here, because I wanted to show you. I'm actually going to bring up a live dashboard to show you the solar and battery that's being produced at Justin's farm right now. So bear with me while I change screens. I'm going to do this. OK, so this is today. This is live. So right now, uh, the green line represents the battery. So the battery is not discharging. It's just in 100% ready mode for the power to go out. This is overnight, 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. The, the blue line represents what the barn is consuming. The purple line, which matches exactly, is the power that's coming from the grid. And then you see over here in the morning, 8 a.m. or so, just before 9 a.m., the sun is starting to come up and produce energy, which means that that purple line, what he's consuming, is starting to go down. In fact, it goes down so much, it goes below zero, and he's starting to build up credits as the sun comes up and produces enough energy for his barn's consumption. Now this is also because Justin chose to install solar and battery. This is just a small portion of the energy being created from the sun. This is the portion of the solar that's connected directly to the batteries. I wanted to show you, I'm gonna to go to another date here. Let's go to March 1st. And this is a typical, you know, a typical full day. So again, you can see the battery is ready to go if needed. Consumption and power overnight. As the sun comes up, the grid power is less in demand. It goes down below zero, and he's building up credits. And the sun produces the energy that it needs for the business. I think if I go a day before, I think this is when Justin and I were on the phone. I was in St. John, and he was at the farm. We were playing with the battery. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to see what happened. So I'm going to get rid of some. OK. So what we were simulating here, again, this is overnight, <clears throat> and this was throughout the day. The blue line is how much the barn was um, consuming. The purple line is what's coming from the grid. It went down because the sun came up. 
But what we did here, you see where the purple line drops immediately down to zero? We turned off the power. We simulated a power outage, but he's still getting power. It's actually at the end of the day. So the power wasn't coming from the sun. You see the sun is down here. That's when his battery turned on. So this green line, again, I'm going to get rid of some of these, some of this noise. So the battery turned on and started discharging the, battery, the power and matched the energy consumption that his farm needed. And then when we turned the power back on, the battery started charging. That's, the, that's showing the battery charging. So I wanted to, that was just meant to show you um, sort of a live example of the kind of data that you can expect to see we did with the solar farm and battery installation. Um, there we go. That is the end of my presentation. So I know we're going to get into questions. I'm yep. going to put some photos up here that Sarah gave us. And then Hans, yeah, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Are we on? Hello? OK, that's better. Yeah, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, a very interesting presentation. I know you're generating a lot of interest in the audience. So uh, the format we're going to use uh, today is um, the fireside chat format. I'm going to ask uh, the producers um, uh, a generic question plus a, a specific question, a backup specific question specific to their own operations. And we're going to go around and do that. And then I really want to open it up to the audience and, and take you know, a back and forth conversations, take questions from the audience, try to get a conversation going either for the producers or for Jeff, um, and, and really try to explore the subject. So with that in mind, I think we'll start with, with Paul. We'll pick on Paul first, and we'll start with Paul, because he was the one looking forward to being up here and being mic'd and recorded the most. So we want to make sure he gets his 15 minutes of fame. And uh, the two questions I would have for you, Paul, was basically, you know, just very basically, you know, what made you decide to install solar on your farm? And, um, and the backup question to that would also be, you know, maybe some of the pros and cons. You're one of the farms that decided to do your, your self-installation. You didn't, you didn't have it installed by Smart Energy. You guys installed it yourself. So, you know, why did we pick solar? Why is that on your farm? And, you know, some of the lessons you've learned maybe and, uh, and you know, the pros and cons of the self-installation choice. Just speak, it'll be open. Um, yeah, so we've looked at solar in the past. And at that time, you're always chasing grant money to, to be able to make it affordable. So when Jeff came and showed us the incentives that were just immediate, you just put it on your taxes and, and you got it. So that was one thing. And maybe Jeff didn't touch on it as much, but the new rate design that mm -hmm. ME Power is proposing we wanted to get in ahead of that, so that we'd be grandfathered in, which really makes it more more affordable. Where your net metering right now, you're for whatever we put out, we're going to get the same amount of money back for what we produce. They're going to change it, so you're going to pay the same amount, but you're, you're only going to get back what it costs them to produce a kilowatt hour. Um, so that was one thing. And the quick depreciation last year made it more attractive. Um, instead of depreciating over 10 or 15 years, one year. Yeah. And, and uh, the pros and cons of your decision to go with self-installation, was that the right decision for your farm? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we tend to try to do everything we can. So, and then it was pretty, pretty simple, just like Lego boulder together, stand it up. We chose to put ours on a concrete slab. A lot of people do screw Healy piles, but the slab, again, that's something we can do ourselves. Mm -hmm. Just as affordable as we can make it. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll, go to, uh, we'll go to Justin next. And uh, Justin, same question for you. You know, the start off question is what made you decide to go with a solar farm? And, um, and the second one, because of your specific setup, you know, maybe take a little bit and explain how the backup power uh, battery system has benefited your farm so far. So yeah, it took us about, I would say probably four years of back and forth with the solar company to finally come to a, come to a decision to, to actually go forward with the, uh, with the project. Um, I think with the batteries, that kind of pushed us forwards, where we were, we were kind of looking for backup generation for, for our poultry barn, and uh, it really turned out well when we were able to test it right after. I guess kind of what Jeff said, we were able to test it a few days after we, uh, after we put it in, and 
It, uh, it lasted us about 24 hours and we still had, I think it was close to 50% battery left to, uh, to save us for the day, so. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jesse, uh, same questions for you on, you know, what made you decide to go with solar um, uh, at your farm? And, um, and also just the, um, the pros and cons of having it installed, because in your case, you had Smart Energy install the system. So, you know, how you felt about that? We, we've uh, been looking into uh, getting, doing power for a while. We, 20 years ago, we talked about putting a windmill up and the price wasn't there. We actually had a bunch of people come down and talk to about manure digester and said it wasn't feasible for us at that point as well. Um, I'm good friends with Frank Jobs' son and we were talking to him about his system and I called Mark in January and I think I called him January 2nd and he was out there January 3rd and we had a feasible study done by February 1st and uh, we gave him a check on March 1st. I think that's how quick it went down. Um, the pros and cons of them doing it was all pros because I didn't have to do it. I'm finding myself extremely busy with the dairy farm part of it. Um, the fact that they were able to put it on a piece of land where I could not farm, so it wasn't taken away from my uh, fields where I silage for cows, uh, it was a very huge benefit. And I said the company was great to work with as well. So, Great. great. And uh, a couple of quick questions for you, Jeff, um, because you had mentioned in your presentation that New Brunswick has a 100 kilowatt cap on there, but I noticed that one of the projects, I think it was, uh, I think it was Mitham Farms that did 120 kilowatts or was 100, that was us. 120 yeah. kilowatts. So, so how does that work if you said we had a 100 kilowatt cap? Yeah, great. Can everyone hear me okay with this mic I have on? Yeah. Is that coming through? So without getting too much into the technical side, the solar is measured in DC, but also in AC. And so Envy Power's 100 kilowatt limit is 100 kilowatts AC at the meter. We can actually put more DC power onto the system, and it just means that you can ex have more times during the day that you're really maximizing that 100 kilowatt AC output. So that's, uh, that's why you'll see different size DC systems. So I probably should have clarified that was 120 kilowatt DC. No, that's good. And the other question I had was because I know that you guys have designed your system and they're built here and, you know, you've got a 50-year guarantee and you're standing behind the product. My question would be on the battery backup system and, would, you know, what is the lifespan um, on the battery backup systems and you know, how often that they, that they will need to be replaced? Yeah, great question. So the product that we work with is, I think I said, provided by Generac. They have a 15-year warranty on their batteries and it, it's also tied to the number of power cycles. Um, we work really closely with Generac and we like the investment that they're putting into those clean energy products. So we think that when those batteries are ready for replacement, there's going to be technology that's even more power dense, even more affordable. That's the direction we've been seeing battery move, but battery investments today are warranted for 15 years. They'll last longer, but they're warranted for 15. Okay, and Paul. Um, Jeff, maybe you can explain a little bit where batteries are going to come to benefit in this demand, on the demand side. Yeah, for sure. So if you remember when, uh, when I was showing the graph uh, that had the purple, uh, the purple and the blue line. So the blue line was Justin's, the energy his barn was needing, and the purple line was the energy that NB Power is providing. So NB Power, under this new rate design, will look at the period of a month, and they'll look for the highest point on that purple line. And at that instant, they're going to measure how many kilowatts you're pulling from the system at that time. And they're going to charge, you'll see a charge on your bill uh, and I think it's $11 and something per kilowatt each month. And so that's where we estimate, probably on the low side, for a small barn, you'll see probably $500 to $800 in a demand charge. Um, industrial customers, by the way, in New Brunswick pay this today. But it's looking like they, they want to they change this for farmers. So the way battery can help is you can program the battery to say, when my demand from the grid gets to point X, I want the battery to come on. And then the battery will discharge and the grid will never go beyond that point. So you won't necessarily eliminate that demand charge, but you can significantly reduce it. That's one way that your battery will be able to help. And then the other point is when, uh, when producers like MB Power, St. John Energy, when everyone gets up in the morning and you have your hot shower and you turn on the microwave and run the stove and at night you come home, everybody in the province is using a tremendous amount of electricity and they have to fire on all other generators to be able to provide that. So it's more costly for them to produce that electricity than it is at 2 a.m., for example. 
So NB Power wants to change the rates so that you as a customer will pay more for the electricity at those times of day. We see this in Nova Scotia now, it's been in Ontario for quite some time, and NB Power has this in front of the Energy Utility Board today. So the way that battery can help you is, let's say NB Power determines between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. electricity is going to be more expensive. Well, you just go on your phone and you program your battery to say, at 6 a.m., I want the power to come from my battery that I generated from the sun yesterday. And then at 8 a.m., you can go back to pulling it from the grid. So it helps reduce those costs in addition to being great backup power. And along with that different rate of power, different with that rate change policy, and if we're paying different rates for power at different times a day, does the same thing rever work on the reverse metering? We'll be getting paid different rates for the power we're feeding back into the grid. That's an awesome question. I don't know the answer to that in New Brunswick, but I will tell you in Ontario, uh, they have a whole bunch of electrical distributors. So one Hydro One that oversees the whole grid, but a bunch of different distributors. And what they were doing was taking the power perhaps during the day when it's the most expensive, they were taking those credits, but they were only giving their customers the credit for the cheapest time of day. So just in the fall of last year, Hydro One put out a memo to say, mm -mm -mm, sorry guys, you can't do that. If you're gonna charge this rate, you better credit this rate. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be watching that, and if, um, if, if, if it looks like they're going the opposite direction, we're gonna point out what's happening in Ontario, because it, again, the power that you're not using and putting back to the grid, every power is using, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's open it up to everybody else here today. Have any other questions um, from there? Yes, David Coburn. Uh, a couple of people, I guess start with Paul. What was the difference in the cost of the concrete compared to the screw piles? Oh, David, off the top of my head. Um, it, was it was cheaper. Concrete oh. was cheaper. Yep. Okay. Like a Healy pile, we got quotes anywhere from 400 to $800 a pile. And what is there? Ten on each array, Jeff. So Ten on each one. Yeah. Yeah. So there's about eight thousand, right? Yeah. yeah. And I did concrete, land, and everything was five thousand for the two arrays. Right. Okay. Second question, David. Yeah. So the second follow-up to that. That's on slope, though, David. Like we had a flat piece of ground, right? Yeah. But the, uh, do you think the concrete? has more reflective properties than just on the bare ground. Yeah, sure. We, if I and no maintenance. That, the, maintenance uh, is done. There's no weed eaten. No or, weeds. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, the project, the, the photo on our first slide at Farms of the Future for McCain, they've got 10 nor'easters and they're going to do a study of different materials underneath each of the solar rays to see how that improves or doesn't improve the reflectivity to generate cool. more power. That's going to be interesting to watch. Other questions? Mr. Churchill, uh, let's go to Marco because it's closer and then we'll go to Mr. Churchill. Thank you. I have about like 50 questions, but I'll limit myself to just a couple. <clears throat> How far can we go from the panel to the setup, like the barns or anything? Is there we, a limit? Yeah, we, we like to keep it under 300 feet. Uh, that's, that's great, but it's not a, a, a strict limitation. We certainly have gone further just means larger electrical wire, which can, can be a little bit more costly. Uh, what we have found that's most effective uh, at Rothamay Farms, they just happened to need a new meter um, on their property where they wanted to build their solar farm in the future, and so that was really beneficial. We were able to connect to a meter that was much closer to where he wanted the solar installed. But, you know, anywhere up to 300 feet is ideal. Thank you. And uh, as far as electrical, like, is it complicated how, how does it work with generators and transfer switch and all that how do you connect so that it doesn't it transfers correctly and doesn't have any gap or any shutouts during, in the barns when when that happens I guess the simple answer is we have people a lot smarter than me that do that part of the business <laughs> uh, it can get complicated which is why we work really hard to have I mean it obviously requires an electrician to do that interconnection but we've worked really hard to train our electricians all throughout their apprenticeship on the uniqueness of connecting <laughs> solar energy and specifically battery. It can get technical and complicated, but when you do enough of this, it, you know, there's not a lot of differences between the different projects. I hope that answers your question. I'll, yes. I'll, just, I'll just add a, one thing is you need utility for the solar panels to make power. Right. So if you lose power, you're not, you're not back feeding to the grid or something because it, it's shut off. 
as soon, soon as your utility shut off, your back they're, they're shut off. So you're not you're not worried about back feed into the grid or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Churchill. Hi. Thank you. Great presentation. So just a couple of questions. One would be, what is the long-term efficacy on the panels. Most reports I hear they have about a 25-year lifespan and they decrease in efficiency year on top of year. I'm sure improvements have been made. Yeah, again, just want to make sure, can everyone in the back hear me okay? Yeah? Give me a thumbs up. You can't hear me. Okay, great. Thanks. So yeah, fantastic question. So um, we, we, there's a couple of different suppliers that we use for our solar modules. They all have uh, what's called a 30-year production warranty. So every solar module will degrade over time. These degrade by about a half a percent per year. But the manufacturer says that if at 30 years, if they're not producing 80% of what they did on day one, they'll be replaced through the warranty. They'll produce for many more years, but they'll continue to degrade over time. Excellent, thank you. And the other question would be just for the three gentlemen on, on stage. How close are you guys to being at a net zero cost on your electrical bill for me I'm not close at all <laughs> not close at all yeah I think we're about 45 percent of our usage I'm, I'm hoping we're gonna be pretty close actually I'm very hoping it's going to be pre uh, when we did our feasible study we we're 102 percent and um, so uh, we only actually received uh, just actually got up and going probably finally we, in January, so I can't give you any information for sure, but this is a feasible study said 102%. I'm holding Mark to his word, and if he doesn't produce, I'll have him talk to him. There you go. <laughs> He's got his cell phone number. <laughs> is, is the limiting factor on that the size of what you can put in? Is that the limiting factor? It, it can be, but again, what that back to that unique aspect of virtual net metering for farmers, so the, the net metering rule is 100 kilowatt AC at the point of interconnection. Because many farmers have multiple meters, so I'll, I'll use Justin as an example, if I can. Multiple barns over multiple meters, the solar installation that he has connects to one meter and offsets three other meters. If Justin chooses to do more solar later, so he's maxed out the cap on that meter, mm -hmm. but he's got six other meters that he can max out the cap again and offset more power. So, Yes, there is a limitation, but farmers have this really great advantage that you can get around that. And would he have to max those out at those meters, or could he just simply add onto the system and put it all into one meter and get credit for the other five? You, the most you can put on any one meter is 100 kilowatts AC. Okay. So he would need to connect to another meter okay. in order to offset other meters. Yep. kind of like using the grid like a gigantic battery. You're trickle charging the grid uh, for any extra power that you're not consuming on your own farm first. So as battery technology improves and as we get better at doing that, we'll need the grid less and less for that kind of, uh, that kind of treatment. Does that okay. answer your question? Other questions? Yeah, we have one. So I have two, two remarks and, and questions, I guess, as well. Um, one thing you mentioned, Paul, that sort of stood out to me was that uh, with MB Power's pro proposed rate changes that might be applicable to farms in that the net metering may be, you know, they're grandfathered as it is now um, and the rate structure could change in the future. That could possibly really significantly stretch out the payback period for an installation like this. Um, that's a thought I had. Maybe stretch, you can... stretch it out here? Yeah. Or shorten it? Stretch it out um, if, shorten. like, a later adopter, for example, if I if I put a system in in a couple of years, when MB Power changed the rate structure on the net meter, um, you mentioned it uh, it may be a, a disadvantage, perhaps. Yeah, I, I can answer that for you. If yeah. You like. So, uh, in in St. John, for example, so St. John Energy, their net metering program isn't a one for one credit like MB Power. So, for every dollar of energy you generate 
they'll only give you 90% of their avoided cost, which is 60 or 65 cents on the dollar. So yes, it can extend the payback, I think is your question. Yes. But again, back to Mark's point, this is really only when you require net metering. And again, we try for the most part to design our systems to meet the energy needs that your business has during the day. Net metering is a great buffer to have, but part of Paul's reason was to get grandfathered into that program so that he can maintain that one-to-one -one credit in the future. Great. And the other thing, um, Justin, you mentioned like with your, your battery backup uh, installation, um, either you or, or the other gentleman with the company here, can you comment on, I guess, what the anticipated uh, maximum run time would be to supply that burn on your current battery? Like, can you run it on your, your current burn energy demand for yeah, one day, oh, yeah. three days? Any idea? So with the, with the way we ran it, I guess in, at the time of the year, we weren't using a whole lot of ventilation or heat uh, in the barn, so we were actually able to run for a full 24 hours and still had about 50% of uh, battery left. Um, I ended up turning it off just to let it charge up throughout the day, and then I used it again the next evening. So I would guess at that time of year, we probably would have been able to get at least 48 hours, uh, but I think it was designed for around 12 with peak usage. Okay. So with that system, just another question, um, with the solar array on that particular burn, do you still have the backup, backup capability? We, for, we've got a backup for the backup. Okay, yeah. gotcha. All right, that's all I had. Can you charge your batteries off of your backup? No. Other, other questions from the floor? One of the questions I had, Jeff, was um, you had mentioned that uh, while New Brunswick, I think, and PEI have 100 kilowatt uh, cap, mm -hmm. uh, Nova Scotia has moved to a thousand. That's right. And is that something that we're lobbying for or talking to government about, um, you know, to raise our caps here? Yeah. We, um, we're, as a company, somewhat limited in how much we can lobby. Frankly, NB Power has a, a, mm -hmm. a big stick that they can hold over us. But I would highly encourage you as an association to, to, to talk about that with officials. Um, you likely are in conversations with the New Brunswick Ag Alliance. They've actually got interveder status with the Energy Utilities Board. Mm -hmm. You would have far greater power than we ever could to say, here's what our businesses need to take a step forward. Because, uh, frankly, some of the changes are, are going to take us a step backwards in terms of cleaner energy in this province. So we're happy to help provide you with some information, if you like. But the folks at the Agriculture Alliance have been working on this for a while. So okay. I would really encourage you as a commodity group to have the conversation. Is that something that you as a group want to lobby on behalf of your farmers? More questions from the floor? Yes. Kim. Do we know when MB Power, no, sorry. Do we know when MB Power uh, is planning to do this rate design change? Um, Mark, I'm looking to you if you have more specific dates. I know the matter is in front of the Energy Utility Board now. But that doesn't necessarily tell us when the changes will be implemented. Can you share more? I, I can say that they wanted to have it done last year. And the smart meters that everyone I'm sure has heard of are being rolled out right now. And those smart meters is the technology they need to support the decision that the Energy and Utility Board has already approved. So it's, it really, I, I, it's just a matter of time, but it's, it's sooner than later. So if I were to take a guess, I'd say within the next 18 months, we'll probably see that happen. Okay. Mark, do you know what a peak rate would be in this new design? I wrote it down it, in my notes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, we don't know for sure. There, there is, because of the pressures uh, that, that are being put on the decision now for the rate strike, specifically with farmers, and I guess we can't, we can't have these conversations without getting into the technical side of it. And, and the technical side of it in New Brunswick is that farmers are actually on the residential rate. And that's the key issue for the utility company is uh, farmers are enjoying that, that rate structure. Uh, what they wish to do is transfer you to a commercial rate right. where they can charge you that uh, peak demand. Um, it, it will appear as though it's more valuable because it's actually less cost per energy, but it's more cost for the amount of energy that you need or mm -hmm. the, the peak of it. So the net result is not good. The rate right now for commercial meters is a little over $11 per kilowatt. Mm -hmm. So if you have 1,000 kilowatts, 
peak in a month, it'll be that times $11 and something. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the floor? Dave, one more. David Coburn. So just looking at the sighting on uh, some of these arrays, uh, we've been blessed or cursed, whatever your point of view, on this past winter and the lack of snowfall. You get a winter with a maximum snowfall, like some of the storms Cape Britain just got. Would there be possibly sometimes you've got to go in and physically remove snow between those units? We've not seen that very often, but yes, if it's, especially if it's in a windy area where you might get snow drifts, uh, it's not absolutely mandatory, but if there's snow accumulates and it's creating shade on the solar panels, it would be great to remove it. That frankly would probably only impact it early in the morning or late at night when the sun is lower in the sky. But certainly if you're getting snow accumulating in front of them, it'd be a great idea to remove the snow if you can. You never really need to remove the snow from the solar panels. That, that will shed off automatically. Yeah, I figured that, but it's what built up between the, exactly. the two arrays, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I guess the next question would be uh, uh, insuring these and, and what's involved with that. Yeah, what, what, great how, question. how the insurance companies look at that. Yeah, there was, I don't know if anyone saw, there was an article in the Telegraph Journal last week about a farmer, I think in the Moncton area, that had challenged getting insurance. They, well, first of all, they had solar on the barn which adds some other complexity in terms of insurance liability. Um, we have ha heard from some of our farmers in the past about the cost of the insurance quote that they've received. Um, when, we, when we started the company, one of our early uh, funders was actually a family insurance brokerage. Um, when Mark moved the business from the basement of his home, he went into kind of a closet space in their building. So we, we actually have a really long standing relationship and connection with the insurance industry in New Brunswick and we've been sort of educating them about what does solar mean and what are the true risks. Again, it's relatively new in this part of the world, but in Europe they've been doing solar and insuring solar for 30 years, right? So part of the benefit of putting it on the ground is there's less risk, there's less liability. We've come up with a product for customers that don't want to have insurance, that can have a sort of a fully replaceable insurance, self-insurance program, um, but there's, there's not a challenge having the solar farm uh, insured today when you install them on the ground. Okay. I'd also add a comment to that. The other writers have wanted to look at whether or not buildings are occupied, so if you live in the facility or you're using it for operations of some sort, that will increase the risk for them. So this is one of the advantages of having kind of a virtual system generating the cloud on its own. I guess if I can follow up with one more, what about vandalism? Has that been, a, been an issue, kids throwing rocks, that sort of thing? Yeah, knock on wood, we've not, we've not had any calls about vandalism today. Okay. Gotta be nice to your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Kim, Thank you. another question here from Kim. Uh, this is for Justin, your backup batteries, how long do they Take, uh, I don't, do they seem to recharge quite quickly, like in a timely manner? Honestly, I don't know if we've used them enough to really be able to tell. Would you have any idea, Jeff? What yeah, so when we did that test a couple of weeks ago, we, I think we brought the batteries down to about 90% state of charge, yep. and they were back up to 100% state of charge uh, the next morning. When the sun came up, within about two hours? Yeah. yeah. The, the other aspect of the batteries is they're not sort of a one size fits all. So you can, what we do is we look at the electricity that you need in a backup power situation, and then we can design the battery system around that. And so, you know, if Justin came to me and said, well, one thing I learned was around his feeder belts and the manure belts. He really only, in normal operations, they're not running 24 seven, they're only running certain parts of the day. So we were able to take that information into account when we designed the battery. There's no point designing a battery that's far for him to run those systems 24-7. He doesn't run them 24-7 ever. So, so the battery is really flexible to be matched around what your energy <coughs> needs are. Now if, if, he, if the power went out and he all of a sudden decided to run his manure belts 24-7, well the batteries are going to deplete really quickly, right? But it's, it's about designing them effectively. 
Just maybe just explain the size of the Justin's batteries. So I, I, I pictured a room full of batteries. Yeah, great question. So, so uh, the battery cabinet is about five feet tall. Uh, it's as wide and thick as an electrical panel that you would see in your wall, but about so five feet tall. About the same size as that podium. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, maybe a little bit taller. And it sits on your wall indoors, and you can have one of them. Justin has four of them. You can have 15 of them. And each of those batteries has up to six little battery modules. So even at the very small scale, someone can have one cabinet and just three battery modules and see how that works. And then you can add, if it's not enough, you can add one more battery module without having to add a whole bunch of electrical infrastructure up to you, till you fill the cabinet. So they're, they're, that's one of the reasons we really like that solution is it's so flexible and modularized. Can, can you use batteries in the backup without a solar system? You can, yeah. In fact, I'm just back from the London Farm Show in London, Ontario, and I'm learning that residential customers there, because they have that time of day usage, they're putting batteries in their home without solar, they're charging them up at night when they only pay two cents a kilowatt hour, and then they're discharging them during the day when the grid wants to charge them 20 cents a kilowatt hour. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, uh, thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a, a great uh, fireside chat. I think we're reaching the end of our, our hour. Um, so I just want to give our producers a chance for you know maybe a few final words or a few final thoughts on on your solar projects and um, you know if if you're happy with everything overall and if you'd recommend other producers look into this. Yeah, I'm happy overall generally. Well, one thing I will say, which is a struggle for us, they are they they are large. And where do you put them? Like on our farm, we, we probably would have done more, but we're struggling. Where, where, do, where do we put these that we, that we really would like to have them? But yeah, just let them sit there and do, do their thing. Okay. Yeah, I think so far we've been pretty happy with what, what we've seen. Um, really, we got them going. I think it was around December when we actually first got everything going and we were able to see the production happen. So we've, uh, we're still, still a little early in the process, but we seem to be happy with what we have so far. So. Okay. Also, be ha I'll say I'm happy as well. I'd say be patient with MB Power. Very patient with them. Um, it's, it's not a race. They're slow, but they do get to you eventually. But patience is virtue. And that's all I really have to say with that as well. So. Okay. And Jeff, closing words? Uh, I, I really want to thank you guys for, you know, speaking about your projects. I mean, we're really proud to work with these guys, but we're also really grateful that they're helping our family business too. So, yeah, thank you. And thanks to Sarah for the opportunity. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for participating in the panel. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your presentation and agreeing to come here today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that as well. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Going on a media tour of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, I really, really appreciate it. Ooh, I'm going to drop this thing. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> Just the same yeah. thing. <laughs>